I'm Eric. This is the Commander's Beacon. We're here to talk about some unconventional ways that you might build your commander deck. So I just noticed on the art for the new legendary squirrel, uh, Toski Bearer of Secrets, it looks like Toski has lost a paw and it has a um, very improvised claw prosthetic. So what's the story behind that? Anyways, this is the set review of Call Time for Commander, and there is a lot to talk about. We've got gods, there's snow, there's a bunch of different tribes, there's a bunch of new commanders, so there is a lot to discuss today. All right, so Kaldheim. Man, this set is vibrant. I was expecting something bleak and arctic, like parts of Skyrim, but nope, there's literally a rainbow aurora on like every other card or something. So anyways, today we are reviewing what's new for Commander from Kaldheim and from the two Kaldheim Commander Precon decks. Uh, we're lumping all of this together for this discussion, so just be aware of that. Uh, some of the new cards I'll be talking about can't be found in Kaldheim Booster Packs. Uh, again, they'll be from the Commander Precon decks. Now, I'll try to focus on new Commander deck options that come from the new cards in this set, uh, rather than a review of each legendary creature, uh, just because there's so much more that goes into a deck than just what's in the Command Zone. Though I definitely will be reviewing uh, many of the legendary creatures too. But there is a lot to talk about, so let's get right into it, starting with the new mechanics in Kaldheim. And the first brand new mechanic in Kaldheim is Boast. So Boast is an ability that shows up on some creatures. Uh, Boast abilities have an activation cost, and they can only be activated once each turn, and only if that creature attacked this turn. Uh, for example, Dragonkin Berserker has Boast, 4 and a red, create a 5-5 dragon creature token with flying. Uh, so if Dragonkin Berserker attacked this turn, you can pay 4 and a red to make a 5-5 dragon token once per turn. There are 15 creatures featuring the boast mechanic, and all of them are monocolored. Four are white, four are black, six are red, and one is green. None are blue. That would lead me to the conclusion that blue is a very humble color, but that sounds suspiciously incorrect. Anyways, boast abilities can be activated at instant speed anytime after the declare attacker step, all the way until the end of the turn, provided the boast creature attacked this turn. For example, Boast can be activated before blockers are declared, so Gold Maw Champion, for example, can prevent a single creature from blocking by paying one and white when it attacks. Now, most of the time you'll only be able to use Boast on your own turn, uh, since typically your creatures can only attack during your turn. But there are a very, very small number of exceptions, uh, like Assault Suit. So, unless your Boast creatures have haste, and only one does, but it's bad, or unless you can give them haste, you won't be able to trigger boast abilities right away. Uh, furthermore, most boast abilities are fairly lackluster for our format, uh, with the exception perhaps of Varagoth Blood Sky Sire, whose boast ability is basically Vampiric Tutor. Now there is Bergi, God of Storytelling, who lets your creatures boast twice each turn rather than once, uh, but most likely anyone building Bergi in the command zone will be building around her first ability instead, which adds red to your mana pool whenever you cast a spell. So for the most part, Boast is not going to be a very relevant mechanic for Commander anyways. So let's move on to the next new mechanic in Kaldheim, and that is Fortell. Now, Fortell is a pretty interesting mechanic. It's sort of like Morph, uh, but without the potential downside of your spell being a, you know, a vulnerable vanilla 2-2 creature for a while. Now, a card with Fortell can be cast normally, or you can foretell it. To foretell a card, you pay 2 mana and exile it face down from your hand during your turn. Then on any later turn, you can cast the card for its foretell cost. Uh, with Saw It Coming, for example, you can cast it for 1 blue blue, like it's a cancel and you're just trying to make a point of defeating your opponents with bad cards. Or, since you're a reasonable commander player who doesn't cast cancel, you can instead Pay 2 during your turn, and Exile saw it coming face down from your hand. Then you can cast it on any later turn at any time that you could normally cast the spell, 
and since again this is an instant that's any time, and you cast it for its foretell cost of one and a blue. So again, if, if I foretell saw it coming from my hand during my turn, that is if I pay two mana and exile it from my hand, I can't pay one and a blue to cast that spell during that turn. I have to wait until at least the next player's turn before I can cast it. So foretell cards have this short delay between when we foretell the spell and when we can actually cast it. But despite that, foretell can often let you cast a spell sooner in a game than you would otherwise be able to by breaking that cost up into two payments. Uh, the two mana to foretell it, and then later the foretell cost. Let's take another example. Uh, Shepherd of the Cosmos is a 3-3 angel that costs six mana, four and two white. When it enters the battlefield, you return a permanent with CMC two or less from your graveyard to the battlefield, and it has foretell for three and a white. So on turn two, you can foretell this into exile from your hand, and then you can cast it, uh, for example, on turn four for that foretell cost of three and a white, rather than waiting until turn six or whatever to pay the full cost of four and two white to cast it from your hand. And there are a bunch of foretell cards, 41 of them to be exact. They are all monocolored or colorless. 11 are white, 11 are blue, 8 are black, 6 are red, 4 are green, and 1 is a colorless artifact. Now white and blue have the edge here because one of Kaldheim's two commander precons is led by Raynar the Ever Watchful. Uh, this is an Azorius commander that cares about foretell and other exile effects. Uh, Raynar was so obviously built around Fortel that I don't think I need to talk about him anymore, so I won't. Now, we recently got another Exile Matters commander in Bell Borka Spectral Sergeant from Commander Legends, uh, but note that Fortel cards will not work with this commander. Uh, Bell Borka gets power equal to the greatest CMC of cards that uh, have been put into Exile this turn, but since Fortel cards are placed into Exile face down, they don't technically have a mana cost while they're in Exile, so Bell Barca won't see them. But you could play around with Fortel in a discard deck, like uh, Neheb the Worthy, for example, by emptying your hand to Fortel effects while your opponents actually have stuff that they need to discard. Now, if you want to play around with the Fortel mechanic in non-Azorius colors, you would also want to consider Dream Devourer if you're in black. Dream Devourer is a 0-3 demon cleric that costs one in the black, and it doesn't have Fortel itself, but it does give Fortel to every non-land card in your hand. And that Fortel cost is equal to its mana cost, reduced by two. And, and if you also share my very rational hostility towards Cancel, but at the same time you're choosing to play something like Murder, first don't do that. Second, if you assist on doing so anyways, you should consider replacing Murder with Poison the Cup. As long as you're building around the Fortel mechanic, that is. Because let's face it, if you're not building around Fortel, you also shouldn't be playing Poison the Cup. Anyways, Poison the Cup is a strictly better murder. It's one black black for an instant that destroys target creature, but if it was foretold, you scry too. And that Fortel cost is one and a black. So yeah, if, if murder wasn't completely invalidated already, and I'm pretty sure it was, then Poison the Cup definitely invalidates it. So that's Fortel. Uh, there's obviously enough of this mechanic to build around in Azorius colors. I mean, there's a precon that's already done just that. Outside of Azorius, I think the strongest uh, cards with this mechanic will see widespread adoption across our format. Uh, specifically cards like Saw It Coming and Doomscar, and there might be a few more as well. Now, although Raynar's Azorius Fortel deck is the most fitting place to build around the Fortel mechanic, I think it also has the possibility to play a significant supporting role in other colors. So Fortel is a pretty cool mechanic, and I hope to see more Fortel cards in future sets. Okay, let's talk about runes. Runes are a new type of aura in Kaldheim, but while runes are new, there's only five of them and they're all uncommon. Uh, there's one in each mono color, they each cost two mana, and they each draw you a card when they enter the battlefield, so they replace themselves. So runes differ from typical uh, creature-based auras in that they can enchant any permanent. And as long as the enchanted permanent is a creature, it gets a bonus, whatever the rune grants. Uh, in the case of Rune of Speed, for example, that creature gets plus one plus zero oh, and haste. So, so this matters because we can enchant things that are only creatures some of the time, uh, like lands in a Kamal Heart of Krosa deck, or vehicles, 
Uh, normally auras would fall off of these permanents when the permanent stopped being a creature, but since runes are auras that can enchant any permanent, they'll stay attached. Now runes can also enchant equipment, uh, in which case the equipment gains the bonus provided by the rune. Uh, for example, if I enchant an equipment with rune of speed, then that equipment will also grant the equipped creature plus one plus zero in haste. So since equipment is typically harder to remove than creatures, uh, this helps to protect your investment a little bit better but then putting, you know, a regular creature enchantment onto one of your creatures. So we mentioned that there are only five runes right now, one in each color. Uh, the blue one is called Rune of Flight, and it grants flying. Uh, the green one is Rune of Might, it grants plus one plus one in trample. Uh, the black one is Rune of Mortality, it grants death touch. And the white one is Rune of Sustenance, and it grants lifelink. So these are all fairly small effects, but the runes are versatile in what they can enchant, uh, and they replace themselves when they enter the battlefield. And there are two cards in Kaldheim that support runes. Uh, Runed Crown is an equipment that costs three, it equips for two. Uh, when it enters the battlefield, you can search your library, hand, and or graveyard for any rune, put it onto the battlefield attached to Runed Crown. A Runed Crown by itself gives the equipped creature plus one plus one. So this does give you some tutoring and some recursion for your runes. And then there's Runeforge Champion. This is a 2-3 dwarf that costs 2 and white, and when it enters the battlefield, you can also search your library and or graveyard for a rune, put it into your hand. It also reduces the mana cost of all of your runes to one colorless. So these two rune support cards are actually pretty decent, uh, but the runes themselves are still fairly underwhelming. And again, the strongest way to play runes, at least most of the time, will probably be to put them on equipment uh, to make them harder to remove. But there aren't too many decks where you'll want to run both equipment and auras. Uh, one exception might be Alila Artful Provocateur, who rewards you for casting both artifact and enchantment spells. Now that deck might also run Spectral Steel, an aura that gives the enchanted creature plus two plus two, and you can exile Spectral Steel from your graveyard to return another aura or an equipment from your graveyard to your hand. Uh, you could also use the runes in a Gen Arcanum Weaver deck, uh, since they can be sacrificed to recur other enchantments, and you still get that value of drawing a card when you cast the rune. But look, again, there are only five runes right now, and they're all very, very mediocre. Now, this isn't nearly enough support for runes to see too much play in Commander, at least yet, uh, but I think the mechanic itself is fine. It's not amazing, but with a bit more support, I suspect some decks might run uh, one or two of them that might happen to support the deck's strategy. Uh, but those are the new mechanics in Kaldheim. Uh, let's talk now about the returning mechanics and returning card types in Kaldheim. First, Kaldheim has a bunch of sagas. Uh, 20 to be exact, which almost doubled the total number of sagas in all of Magic. So Kaldheim is a big, big set for sagas. Now, Kaldheim sagas are split evenly across each two color combination and there's one uncommon and one rare in each of those two color combinations. Now, some of Kaldheim sagas are tribal pieces, so they support a specific tribe. Uh, so these might make obvious includes to decks built around that tribe, but they won't otherwise be very useful. Uh, nonetheless, with so many new sagas added to the game, I think there's plenty of support to build around them. But I already covered that in another video. Go check out my complete guide to sagas right here if you want more information about that. But for now, we're going to move on. Okay, equipment. Kaldheim brought us 12 new pieces of equipment. Now, I think ever since equipment were introduced back in Mirrodin Block in 2003, uh, Wizards has been slowly turning down the power level on equipment, uh, generally by making the most powerful of equipment require colored mana to cast, so they can't be easily played in just about every deck. And Kaldheim is no exception. Of the 12 pieces of equipment here, only three of them are colorless, and they're not all that exciting. Uh, there's a series of equipments in each mono color that lets you pay some additional mana when the equipment enters the battlefield to create a creature token and then attach the equipment to it. And these are generally not all that strong either. Uh, probably the only two equipment worth talking about in Kaldheim are attached to two of the gods, uh, but we'll talk about these later when we talk about those gods, uh, which by the way are very cool cards. So I don't think our format gained too much of interest when it comes to equipment in Kaldheim, again, outside of a couple of those gods. Uh, now, in terms of equipment support, I will mention that we've got Axe Guard Armory and Forging the Tyrite Sword, uh, both of which tutor for an equipment. 
Now, these won't generally be your best tutors, though. Uh, Axe Guard Armor is a land that makes you pay effectively 5 mana on top of sacrificing itself to tutor for an equipment, uh, though it can also find an aura if you want that as well, you know, if you're playing a deck that uses both auras and equipment. And Forging the Tyrite Sword only costs 3 mana, and 2 of that will be refunded by the treasure tokens it generates, uh, but this is a saga, and the tutor effect will be delayed by, you know, 2 turns generally. So it's cool to have more equipment tutor options, but I think these ones will generally be limited to budget builds or very, very specific decks. So there's not much else to say about equipment in Kaldheim, uh, despite the hype around the card type that was brought by the early spoilers. Uh, let's talk about another one of Kaldheim's returning card types in Vehicles. Now, Vehicles were first introduced to Magic in Kaladesh block in 2016, and Kaladesh block brought with it uh, 19 Vehicles. Since then, the number of vehicles in all of Magic has grown only modestly to about 36, and of those, 6 are new in Kaldheim. And now, like equipment, Wizards has been making vehicle cards colored uh, to focus them into specific strategies rather than letting just any Jek gem them in. And in Kaldheim, 3 of the 6 vehicles are colored, or at least have color identities that restricts their play in our format. And let's just say it right now, despite the hype, most of these vehicles in Kaldheim are trash. Uh, Kaldheim did not do much for vehicles in the Commander format, so if you were hoping this set would finally give you resources to build that you know, vehicle-centric deck that you were looking for, you're probably going to be disappointed. Now, there are two notable vehicles here I do want to mention. Uh, Essex's Chariot is a 4-4 vehicle that costs 3 and a green, and it crews for 4. When it enters the battlefield, you make two 2-2 two -two green cat creature tokens, and when Essex's Chariot attacks, you create a token that's a copy of target token you control. Now the cool thing here is that it can copy any token, not just a creature token. The bad news is this vehicle has the green color identity, so the most popular vehicle decks, uh, namely Dipala, won't be able to play it. Definitely see this having a place in Amara Soul of the Accord. Now also we have to point out that this vehicle is pretty much just acting as a token doubler first and a vehicle second. I mean, a vanilla 4-4 that crews for 4 is not a very impressive vehicle. So again, even though it's a vehicle, its primary function isn't as a vehicle, but rather it functions to make you more tokens. Now the other notable vehicle in Kaldheim is on the back of an MDFC god, uh, which is actually an interesting, you know, a fairly interesting vehicle, uh, but we'll talk more about that later. Next, let's talk about treasure tokens. Now, if you like to play around with treasure tokens, uh, maybe either for explosive mana generation or for artifact synergies or, you know, with cards like Revelin Riches, Kaldheim has a modest number of cards that can help you out here, but unlike vehicles and equipment, these treasure token-centric cards are very, very nice. First, there's a new mono-red commander option in Magda, Brazen Outlaw, who can convert treasures into tutoring, artifacts, or dragons straight out of your deck and onto the battlefield at instant speed. This is amazing, but I've already discussed Magda in some detail earlier when it was spoiled, and you can see that video here for more details. But there are other cards that support treasures in Kaldheim. A note that there are seven such cards, and all but one of them has red in its color identity. So in Kaldheim, treasures are definitely a red mechanic. There's Seize the Spoils, a decent mono-red card draw spell. Uh, this is two and a red for a sorcery. You have to discard a card as an additional cost to cast the spell, and it lets you draw two cards and make a treasure. Now, if you care about treasures and don't have access to blue, this is a reasonable card draw option. And if you were playing Pirate's Pillage before, then Seize the Spoils will help you draw at a you know, little bit lower initial mana investment. A Pirate's Pillage costs one more mana, but it makes you two treasures instead of one. Otherwise, the two cards are identical. Now, I prefer the new Seize the Spoils for its lower mana cost, but either card here fills the same role. Uh, but if we want another, you know, possibly upgrade, then any deck that was running Prying Blade to make treasures will also want to consider the new Goldbane Pick. Uh, both are equipment that generate a treasure for you when the equipped creature deals combat damage to a player. A Goldvane Pick gives the equipped creature plus one plus one, while Prying Blade only gives plus one plus zero. And Goldvane Pick equips for one, while Prying Blade equips for two. But Goldvane Pick also costs two to cast, while Prying Blade only costs one. Now, based on all of this, I would generally consider Goldvein Pick to be a better card, uh, but it isn't a strict upgrade. 
nonetheless, I mean, if you were running Prying Blade before, you'll probably do a little bit better with Goldvein Pick. But outside of Magda, probably the biggest new card for a deck that cares about treasures is Goldspan Dragon. This is a 4-4 dragon with flying and haste. It costs 3 red red. When it attacks or becomes the target of a spell, you make a treasure. And it has treasures you control have tap, sacrifice this artifact, add 2 mana of any one color. So if you care at all about treasures, and if you have red in your deck's color identity, you'll probably want Goldspan Dragon. Now this doubles the mana output of each of your treasures, and because it has haste, it can attack and generate at least one treasure for you right away. So again, any deck that likes treasures or artifacts or just tokens will want to consider this card. Maybe something like Bruticlad or Sahili the Gifted, but there's plenty of other decks that would like this card too. So despite Kaldheim only having a few cards that generate or care about treasures, some of these cards are absolute winners. Great stuff here. Now there are also a few cards in Kaldheim, uh, six to be exact, that care about you casting your second spell each turn. The most notable one is the new commander option, uh, Firja, Judge of Valor. This is a 2-4 angel with flying and lifelink that costs a bunch of mana, a 2 white black black, and whenever you cast your second spell each turn, look at the top for three cards of your library, put one of them into your hand and the rest into your graveyard. So Firja gives you card advantage in the command zone in Orzhov colors, which is actually really unique. It's also stapled onto an overcosted angel and has self mill, so this card is perhaps a bit confused about what it wants to do. Uh, still, if you care about self mill, this could be an interesting, unique commander uh, that'll help you keep both your hand and your graveyard filled. Now, effects that trigger when you cast your second spell each turn have historically been in blue and red with cards like Jory and Ruin Diver. Uh, all of these effects in Kaldheim, though, are black and white, and almost all of them are completely irrelevant for our format. You might just maybe play Clarion Spirit if you're playing with either tokens or aristocrats and you happen to be casting a lot of spells on your turn and on your opponent's turns. A Clarion Spirit makes a 1-1 white spirit token creature with flying for you whenever you're casting your second spell each turn. This might be okay again, but honestly I'm not sure offhand what deck would really be able to take a lot of advantage of this effect. So outside of Firja, there's not really too much to talk about here. But let's move on to perhaps the biggest and most hyped returning mechanic in Kaldheim, and that is Snow. Now Kaldheim brought a bunch of support for Snow cards. Uh, reprinted a bunch of Snow basics, there's new Snow lands, there's a few Snow commanders, and again there's plenty of other new Snow cards outside of lands and commanders. If you wanted to build around Snow, and now is your chance and you will not be disappointed. First, let's talk about the lands. Snow basics have been reprinted and some of them have pretty cool art. But snow basics are just the tip of the iceberg, so to speak. There are 17 snow lands in Kaldheim. Again, five of those are those basic snow lands. But that means 12 of them are new non-basic snow lands. And I'm really excited about at least 10 of them. So there is a series of 10 new snow lands that enter the battlefield tapped and tap for two colors. So there's one of these lands in each and every two color combination. And these lands are amazing for several reasons. First, uh, perhaps most obviously, they're snow lands. So if you care about snow and you're playing a deck that's more than one color, you want these. Second, they're fetchable. Notice that Alpine Meadow, for example, is a mountain and a plains. So anything that fetches either a mountain or a plains can go and get Alpine Meadow. Third, they're common, so you don't have to skip your meals on the weekends or something to be able to afford these. Yet anyways, I don't know if the price will go up. So the fact that these are fetchable and common means that, you know, I think as long as the price remains low, these lands could see play in lots and lots of decks, and not just decks that care about snow lands. I definitely have one five color deck that wants several of these of these lands. Now, despite these lands being really cool, I definitely don't think they're broken because they enter the battlefield tap. But outside of lands, Kaldheim brought us 29 snow cards, and four of them are even commanders. Uh, we'll talk more about some of these commanders later in more detail. Now, I will point out the snow mechanic is not evenly distributed across the color pie in Kaldheim. Of the 29 snow cards, 9 are mono blue, 5 are mono black, 7 are mono green. But mono red only has two, and Mono White only has one snow card. 
there's also a single colorless snow artifact. And yes, because of recent trends in equipment and vehicles, I now have to unfortunately specify when artifacts are colorless. Now, I'm not going to spend time talking about snow decks specifically. If you're building around snow, the synergies are fairly obvious, and, well, more importantly, I haven't really studied snow as a mechanic too much myself, so I'm not really too knowledgeable to be able to provide too many um, meaningful thoughts on it right now. But anyways, lots of new snow things in Kaldheim, you know, especially within all of these new lands for every color, and especially, you know, snow spells for blue, green, and black. And those decks that just wanted a reprint of the Snow Basics for their extra planar lenses, well, you know, they're probably happy too. But let's move on to another big area that got a lot of support in Kaldheim, and that's some of the tribes. Okay, so we just talked a bit about sagas, and we mentioned that a lot of uh, Kaldheim sagas are support cards for one tribe or another and Kaldheim provided a moderate amount of support for a lot of different tribes. So many tribes. And because there's so many different tribes in Kaldheim, none of them got enough support to build a deck around completely from the cards in Kaldheim alone. Uh, but if the tribe already existed, then the new cards in Kaldheim might just power up existing decks or make new decks possible. But before we talk about each specific tribe in Kaldheim, there's a few cards in the set that support all tribes. First, I need to mention Hunting Voyage. If you're playing a tribal deck with access to black, uh, perhaps vampires or zombies for example, you'll want to consider this one. Hunting Voyage is a sorcery that costs 4 and 2 black, and you choose a creature type, uh, return up to two creatures of the chosen type from your graveyard to the battlefield. If this spell was foretold, however, you return all creatures of the chosen type from your graveyard to the battlefield instead. Now, the foretell cost is a massive 5 and 2 black. So when you add on the 2 mana to exile this card from your hand uh, to its foretell cost, you're paying 9 total mana for this effect. Now a foretold Haunting Voyage is still no Rise of the Dark Realms, uh, but you can foretell it a bit sooner since you're paying that 9 mana over 2 installments of 2 mana and then 7 more mana. But otherwise Rise of the Dark Realms is strictly better. Uh, Rise of the Dark Realms, however, is also at least $10. So hopefully Haunting Voyage can be a budget alternative in a black tribal deck. Now let's talk about Reflections of Litjara. This is an enchantment that costs 4 and a blue. When it enters the battlefield, you use a creature type. When you cast a spell of the chosen type, you copy that spell. So any tribal deck with access to blue that either casts big haymaker creatures like Eldrazi, or that uses enter the battlefield effects on their creatures, might love this card. Be aware though that this is a 5 CMC enchantment that does nothing when it enters the battlefield, uh, so you might be hesitant to include this in any uh, tribal deck that prioritizes speed. But lastly, we need to mention Skemfar, Shadow Sage, and Basalt Ravager. Both of these are creatures that have an enters the battlefield effect, uh, either doing damage or causing life loss among your opponents, equal to X, where X is the greatest number of creatures you control that share a creature type in common. So I want to point these out because even though Skemfar, Shadow Sage, and Basalt Ravager have the Giant and Elf creature types respectively, don't be fooled into thinking that they only go into decks for those tribes. Basalt Ravager, for example, could easily be a Goblin deck kill spell. A Skemfar, Shadow Sage definitely fits in Elf decks, uh, which can explosively vomit little Elf tokens all over the battlefield, but they could also fit in a Vampire's deck or a Zombie's Tribal deck too, for example. But now let's talk about some of the specific tribes that are supported in Kaldheim. And let's start with Changelings. Now most tribes in Kaldheim fall within one of the two color pairs or guilds. And in fact, most two color pairings have an associated tribe in Kaldheim. So those, some of those pairings have very, very few cards. Changelings are the Simic or the blue and green tribe in Kaldheim. Now the actual creature type for Changelings is Shapeshifter. But changeling is a keyword that appears on some, but not all, shapeshifters. And a creature with changeling is every creature type. Actually, a card with changeling is every creature type. And that means that the card is every creature type even when it's not on the battlefield. Uh, for example, when it's in your graveyard or in your hand. So a card like March of the Drowned, for example, could return two changelings from your graveyard to your hand because all changeling cards are pirates. Now, historically, not all shapeshifters are changelings, but in Kaldheim, all shapeshifters are changelings. 
and because changelings are every creature type, and because changelings generally don't have any synergy with each other, it typically makes sense to play changelings in another tribal deck. A Torian Mauler, for example, is not a great card. It's a 3-mana 2-2 that can get very big, but it has no evasion, but it sees play in 6,500 decks on EDH rec because it's a changeling, so it's a member of every single tribe that has red in its color identity. And the Kaldheim changelings are similar. Uh, and there are some decent generic changelings here. A Guardian Glade Walker fits into any tribal deck that cares about plus one plus one counters, as does Bloodline Pretender. Masked Vandal is decent tribal based removal. Now, if you were playing Birthing Bows, a three mana artifact that lets you pay for and tap it to make a 2 2 changeling shapeshifter token, then you might consider upgrading to Maskwood Nexus. Uh, this artifact costs 4, and it gives every creature type you control and every creature type you own that isn't on the battlefield changeling. So this is kind of like an improved arcane adaptation. And Maskwood Nexus also lets you generate a 2-2 changeling shapeshifter token at a slightly reduced cost compared to Birthing Bows, uh, that is for only 3 mana. We've also got a couple of changeling commanders in Morit of the Frost and Orvar the Allform, I'm going to be talking about these two unique commanders later in the video, so we'll cover them at that time. So other than that, I don't have too much to say about changelings. But again, any tribe that you wanted to build from that's in blue and or green, you're going to see a few more cards that support that tribe coming out of Kaldheim. But let's talk about dwarves. Dwarves in Kaldheim are the Boros, or the red and white tribe, which is very typical for dwarves. Some, tri some tribes have expanded into new colors, as we'll see later. Dwarves absolutely did not. Dwarves typically care about attacking equipment and vehicles. They are typically low mana cost, small creatures, and a lot of them, historically at least, are not very good. Which is probably why commanders like Dipala Pilot Exemplar, despite being really unique, aren't typically very strong. Now the dwarves in Kaldheim stick pretty closely to this well-established dwarf routine. Cole the Forge Master here cares about equipment. Now, we already talked about Magda Brazen Outlaw when we discussed treasures, but Magda also cares about dwarves. Notably, there's Stoic Farmer, which is another creature based mana ramp card in white. This is a 3 3 dwarf that costs 3 and white. When it enters the battlefield, you search your library for a basic planes, and if, and if an opponent controls more lands than you, you put that land onto the battlefield tapped. Otherwise, you put it into your hand. Paying 4 mana to ramp, even in white, is a bit much. But Stoic Farmer does have Foretell, so you can split that cost into two payments of two mana, which does help. I point out Stoic Farmer here because it's a dwarf, but it has really nothing to do with dwarves. There's Warchanter Scald, which is a decent inclusion in any equipment deck, especially if it also plays vehicles. Uh, this is a 2-3 dwarf that costs two and a white. Uh, when it becomes tapped, if it's enchanted or equipped, you create a 2-1 red dwarf berserker creature token. Uh, otherwise, other than these two, the dwarves in Kaldheim follow the disappointing trend of cheap creatures with mediocre abilities that don't really have enough impact in the commander format. Uh, I recently advised against building Magda as a dwarf tribal deck since most mono red dwarves are bad, and the mono red dwarves in Kaldheim did very little to improve this. Uh, if you have a dwarf deck built around Dipala, you likely won't add more than one to two dwarves from this set at most. And while Cole the Forge Master can be broken, Cole plays an equipment combo deck. He doesn't care about dwarves at all. So Kaldheim didn't really do much for the dwarf tribe specifically, uh, even, though, even though the set does have a couple of playable creatures that happen to be dwarves. But let's talk about elves. Kaldheim brought us 19 new elves in the Golgari or black and green color identity. Now black is a relatively new color for elves. Now there have historically always been a few elves within the black color identity, but elves really expanded into black with Commander Legends, and now again with Kaldheim. Uh, in fact, between Commander Legends and Kaldheim, there are 22 new elves in the black color identity that have been added to the game. So I'm kind of tempted to lump all of the elves from Commander Legends and Kaldheim together, since these are the two sets that really pushed elves further into black. But we're supposed to be talking about Kaldheim today, so I'll refrain from speaking too much more about Commander Legends cards. Uh, first, Elves got two new Golgari commanders in Herald, King of Skemfar, and Lathril, Blade of the Elves. Herald is completely worthless as a commander, unless you're playing with a Blink deck perhaps to trigger his Enter the Battlefield effect repeatedly, but you're not going to find too many Blink decks in black and green, so we're not going to say any more about Herald. 
Lathril is the commander of the second Kaldheim Commander Precon, which is an elf tribal deck. So Lathril obviously cares about elves, and doesn't really need any more discussion in this video. So let's move on to the additional support that the elf tribe received in Kaldheim and in the Kaldheim Commander Precons. There's Canopy Tactician. This is a 4-mana 3-3 three, three that gives all your other elves plus 1 plus 1, and it can tap for 3 green. This is effective, if unexciting. A Ruthless Winnower is basically Anawan the Ruin Sage for the elf tribe. This is a 4-4 elf that costs 3 and 2 black. It has, at the beginning of each player's upkeep, that player sacrifices a non-elf creature. Now the recent black elves add self-mill, graveyard recursion, and a synergy for elves dying to the elf tribal toolkit, and Kaldheim elves are no different. Coma's Faithful is a 3-mana three 3-1 three of lifelink that causes each player to mill 3 cards when it dies. Elderfang Ritualist is another 3-1 three for 3 mana that lets you return another elf card from your graveyard to your hand when it dies. Probably the most notable elf support creature comes from Skemfar Avenger. This is a 3-1 for 1 and a black, and it says whenever another non-token elf or berserker you control dies, you draw a card and lose one life. Now this only applies to non-token elves, but it's still an obvious include in an elf tribal deck. Now there's also some really strong black and green elf support pieces like Serpent Soul Jar, Herald Unites the Elves, and Elderfang Venom. I'm not going to talk too much about these because, again, they're fairly obvious. Are you playing Elf Tribal? Do you have black and green in your deck's color identity? If so, these are good cards. You should consider them. So, Kaldheim adds a lot of good support for the Elf Tribe, especially in the black color identity. I don't think it expands the Elf Tribe to any new playstyles or archetypes, though, so there isn't too much more to say about it here. So let's move on to Giants. Uh, giants are the Izzet, or Red and Blue Tribe in Kaldheim, there are 14 new giants in this set, including one new commander in Agar, the Freezing Flame. Agar is rather small for a giant. It's a 3-3 that costs one red-blue. It has whenever a creature or planeswalker in opponent controls is dealt excess damage. If a giant, wizard, or spell you controlled dealt damage to it this turn, you draw a card. And Agar is itself both a giant and a wizard. I'm actually really interested in a Spellslinger build with Agar in the command zone, and this is perhaps the strongest way to build Agar. That said, if you wanted to build Giant Tribal, Agar is probably your best bet. And even though a, a Giant Tribal deck with Agar probably won't be as strong as a Spellslinger build, it's still a really solid Giant Tribal option. Though you could also consider a Jeskai Commander like Ruhan of the Fomori, because there's also some good white giants like Realm Cloak to Giant and Sun Titan uh, that you'd miss out on if you're playing Agar. And Ruhan happens to be a giant as well. Now in all of Magic, there are 91 Giants in the Izzet color pairing, and while not all of them are good in Commander, you'll have some decent options for including in an Agar deck from cards even, you know, outside of Kaldheim. Cards like Bonecrusher Giant, Inferno Titan, Gelcaster Colossus. Now Gelcaster Colossus technically cares about Wizards, uh, but there are 9 Giants in Magic right now that are also Wizards, and most of them are at least decent in Commander. Uh, but, but let's actually talk about the other giants that are in Kaldheim. Now first, uh, the giants in Kaldheim are all pretty decent in Commander, and their art is amazing. The Calamity Bearer fits well in any giant tribal deck, but it works even better with Agar as the commander. This is a 3-4 giant, it costs 2 and 2 red. It says if a giant source you control would deal damage to a permanent or player, it deals double that damage to that permanent or player instead. Uh, Cyclone Summoner is a great board wipe for a giant deck uh, with a body attached to it. This is a 7-7 seven, seven giant wizard, it costs 5 and 2 blue, and when it enters the battlefield, if you cast it from your hand, you return all permanents to their owner's hands, except for giants, wizards, and lands. Quakebringer can ping your opponents for 2 damage each upkeep, or each of your upkeeps, even from your graveyard. Uh, this is, again, 5-4 giant, it costs 3 and 2 red, it says your opponents can't gain life, that's amazing. And at the beginning of your upkeep, Quakebringer deals 2 damage to each opponent. This ability triggers only if Quakebringer is on the battlefield, or if Quakebringer is in your graveyard and you control a giant. It also has Foretell for 2 and 2 red if you need that. And there's a lot of decent non-creature support for the tribe too. Uh, both of the Izzet sagas in Kaldheim work well in a giant's deck, for example. There's Battle of Frost and Fire, this costs 3 red-blue. 
Uh, the first chapter deals 4 damage to each non-giant creature and each planeswalker. For the second chapter, you scry 3. And for the third chapter, whenever you cast a spell with CMC 5 or greater this turn, you draw 2 cards and discard a card. There's Invasion of the Giants, which makes perfect sense in a giant tribal deck. It's a saga that costs blue-red. First chapter lets you scry two. For the second chapter, you draw a card. Then you may reveal a giant card from your hand. When you do, Invasion of the Giants deals two damage to target opponent or planeswalker. And for the third chapter, the next giant spell you cast this turn costs two less to cast. There's even Giant's Amulet, which is a decidedly very mediocre equipment that becomes, I think, at least playable in a giant tribal deck, especially one led by Agar. Now, this equipment costs blue and it equips for two. It gives the equipped creature plus zero plus one and hexproof as long as it's untapped, which is fine to protect Agar since he's not going to be tapping or attacking anyways. Uh, and also when Giant's Amulet enters the battlefield, you can pay three into blue. And if you do, you create a 4-4 blue giant wizard creature token then attach Giant's Amulet to it, so it can also make a giant for you if you need it to. I think the Giant Tribe is actually kind of the, the winner of all the tribes for Commander in this set. First, they got a pretty decent new Commander option in Agar, where they really didn't have any good options prior. Second, Giants have been really solidified in Kaldheim as a sort of hybrid spell slinger, big smashy creature type, which is very unique. And is it Giants didn't exist at all as an archetype before Kaldheim? So again, really cool stuff for Giants in Kaldheim, and really cool art. If you've ever wanted to build a giant tribal, now is definitely the time. But let's talk about angels. Kaldheim brought us 14 new angels, and these are in the Orzhov or black and white color combination. Though there is one blue and white angel in one of the commander precons. So Kaldheim did two things for angels that are somewhat new. First, it brought down the converted mana cost for angels. Uh, of those 14 new angels, one of them has a CMC of 2, uh, 3 have a CMC of 3, and there's 5 4 drops. All of this is pretty good for angels, which typically have a CMC of 4 to 7. Uh, Kaldheim also added support for the uh, black color identity for angels, and 6 of them are new in Kaldheim. But when we actually look at the angels in Kaldheim in more detail, uh, they seem more effective in Standard than in Commander. A Youthful Valkyrie, for example, is our 2-drop angel. It's a 1-3 that gets a plus 1, plus 1 counter whenever another angel enters the battlefield or under, under our control. This might be fine in Standard, but it's not very compelling in Commander. But that's just one example. There's plenty of angels in Kaldheim that might be playable in Standard, but just probably don't have the power level needed for Commander. Now, there are a few Kaldheim angels that will fit in an angel's tribal deck, though. Uh, angel tribal decks will often have a lot of life gain, and Valkyrie Harbinger translates that life gain into more angels. Uh, it's a 4-5 angel that costs 6, it has flying and lifelink, and at the end of your turn, if you gain 4 or more life this turn, you create a 4-4 angel token with flying and vigilance. A Vengeful Reaper is a 4-mana 2-3 angel with flying, death touch, and haste, which is the closest you're going to get to a vampire nighthawk in an angel's deck. Now, this isn't great, but it's relatively cheap for an angel, and it will do some work. Uh, you can also use Foretell to perhaps cast a turn earlier. Now, Kaldheim also released a new black and white legendary angel, as we mentioned before, in Furja. But I won't recommend Furja as the commander for your new angel deck, since Furja's abilities don't really support the angel tribe. Uh, Furja provides card advantage and self mill, which a few of the angels in Kaldheim benefit from but I'm not sure there's enough synergy here within the tribe to make this really valuable. Now, as better options for an angel tribal deck, you could use, for example, Acroma Vision of Ixidor paired with Falthus Shadowcat Familiar. Acroma will buff Falthus in combat to at least a 4-4, and most other angels will have at least 1-2 keywords, so she'll buff them as well. And Falthus makes Acroma a 6-6 with Flying, First Strike, Vigilance, Trample, Menace, and Death Touch, which is completely silly. You could also strongly consider Liesa Shroud of Dusk and focus on playing other angels that have lifelink. Uh, Liesa causes any player to lose two life when they cast a spell, including yourself. Uh, so if you focus on angels which have lifelink, uh, you can offset this life loss from having Liesa in play. Of course, there's classic angel tribal options like both Kalias, but anyways, I don't think the addition of new angels in Kaltheim brings any you know, fundamentally new playstyles for the tribe. It just provides a few options for what was already playable. 
especially within the black color identity. Uh, but this isn't a bad thing. Uh, having more options is definitely welcome. Now there's a few other tribes in Kaldheim, but most of these didn't get much support. I'll mention them briefly here for the sake of completion, uh, but there isn't too much noteworthy to say about most of them. Uh, the Berserker tribe received an impressive 26 creatures in black and red in Kaldheim, uh, but outside of being Berserkers, most of these don't really have much in common. There's a single card that cares much at all about Berserkers in Kaldheim, and that's Skemfar Avenger, a Berserker who causes you to draw a card and lose a life whenever another Berserker you control dies. There are a total of 106 Berserkers in all of Magic, and the EDH rec doesn't even have a page for Berserker Tribal, and I'm pretty sure Kaldheim will not change that. Let's talk about Trolls. Trolls are the red and green tribe in Kaldheim. There are seven cards in Kaldheim that either make trolls, care about trolls, or are trolls themselves. Now, the only one of these that cares about trolls, uh, that is, provoke the trolls, is not really playable in, in Commander, so we won't talk more about this tribe for now. Now, Kaldheim also brought us a few zombies, and these make up the blue and black, or Demir tribe. There are nine zombies in Kaldheim, and none of them really add anything new to the tribe. Now, if you already had an existing zombie deck, you might add one or two of these to that deck, uh, but it's not going to change much. But anyways, those are the tribes of Kaldheim. Again, Kaldheim generally has one tribe for each two-color combination, and that's a lot of tribes since there are ten two-color combinations, so most of the tribes didn't get much support. That said, some of the tribes did really well, like giants, uh, and others at least expanded their color pie a little bit, like elves and angels. Now, some color combinations didn't have an associated tribe, a name, uh, namely Selesnia and Azorius, Though Azorius does have most of the Vortel cards, so that's sort of a tribe, I guess. But it's time to talk about the flashy face cards of the set, the MDFC Gods. Alright, the Gods. Keldheim brought us 12 new gods, and they are generally really cool, both from a design perspective and in terms of the gameplay mechanics they introduced to Commander. Uh, before we talk about the individual gods, let's talk about how they differ from gods in previous sets, because they do differ quite a bit. Uh, so if we look at older gods from Theros, Amonkhet, War of the Spark, uh, we can see some common features. First, Resilience. Gods in the older sets are generally either indestructible, or they recur themselves when they die. Secondly, uh, many, though not all, of the older gods used devotion or a similar mechanic uh, that required you to meet certain conditions before they could attack or block. Uh, for example, Theros gods like Heliod have devotion requirements, and if those requirements aren't met, Heliod isn't a creature. Amonkhet gods didn't have the devotions, but they also had requirements. Uh, Kefnet, for example, can't attack unless you have seven or more cards in hand. Now, the Kaldheim gods don't have any of these properties. Uh, they don't have any particular resilience like indestructibility or built-in recursion, uh, but they also don't have any requirements that need to be met just to make them functional creatures. Uh, they can attack and block just fine all on their own. But of course, the most notable feature of all of the Kaldheim gods is that they are MDFCs, or modal dual-faced cards. MDFCs are new from Zendikar Rising, and they are two-sided cards that can be played as either side. But the two sides are separate, so you can either play one side or the other, but not both. Now, all of Kaldheim's MDFC gods are a creature, the god, on one side, and something else on the other side. Uh, Essica here, for example, can be cast either as Essica, god of the tree, a 1-4 creature that costs 1 green green, or can be cast as the Prismatic Bridge, an enchantment that costs Wooburg. Or there's Aegon, god of death, that can be cast as a 6-6 god for 3 mana, or as Throne of Death, a legendary artifact, for one mana. Now, MDFC gods are very cool for Commander specifically. Uh, let's discuss how they work in our format, and specifically in the Command Zone. First, all the gods are legendary creatures, so they can be your Commander. You can cast either side of the God card from your Command Zone. So if my Commander is Aegon, then I can cast either Aegon or Throne of Death from my Command Zone. Secondly, your deck's color identity will be derived from the color identities of both sides of your commander's card combined. So when we talked about Essica, for example, uh, the god side of the card has the green color identity, but the enchantment side of the card has all five colors. So the deck's color identity is all five colors. Thirdly, 
Commander Tax applies regardless of which side of the card I'm casting. So let's say I cast Aegon for 3 mana. Uh, if it dies and I choose to put it back in the command zone, I'll have to pay an additional 2 mana Commander Tax the next time I cast either Aegon or Throne of Death. Uh, so we can't use the two-sided nature of creatures in our command zone to dodge Commander Tax. And lastly, and perhaps most obviously, because most of the gods have some non-creature card type on the reverse side, we now have access to non-creature cards in the command zone, which is awesome by the way. So as I mentioned, there's 12 gods in Kaldheim. All of the god creatures are monocolored, but some of the reverse side cards are multicolored. For the god side cards, there are two that are white, two are blue, three are black, two are red, and three are green. And for the card types on the reverse side of the gods, there are two equipments, one vehicle, one enchantment, one planeswalker, one creature, and six other artifacts. So again, you'll have access to these other card types in your command zone if you pick the associated god as your commander. Again, very, very cool. Now, I won't discuss each of the gods here because some are not very compelling, and others have obvious play lines demanded by the card that would probably be better covered in a dedicated deck tech. But let's talk a bit more about some of the gods that perhaps haven't received as much attention as they as I think they deserve. First, let's talk about Halvar, God of Battle, and Sword of the Realms. Halvar is a 4-4 that costs 2 white-white. It gives all equipped and enchanted creatures you control double strike. And at the beginning of combat, you may attach target aura or equipment attached to a creature you control to target creature you control. And Sword of the Realms is an equipment that costs 1 and a white. It equips for 1 and a white, and it gives the equipped creature plus 2 plus 0 and Vigilance. And when the equipped creature dies, you return it to its owner's hand. Now, the Helvar side of this card lends itself well to an, you know, another boring mono-white equipment deck, but without all the card advantage offered by SRAM. So, not particularly exciting, even if it's you know reasonably strong. I'm much more interested in the Sword of the Realms side of this card. First, we've never had equipment in the command zone. Now, we can try to be completely degenerate and find some infinite sacrifice and recursion combos where Sword of the Realms you know, infinitely recurs some creature that we sacrifice, but I like to think of Sword of the Realms as just some added protection or resilience for some of our creatures. And I think even if we focus on using Sword of the Realms um, rather than Halvar from our command zone, we don't need to go all in on equipment. We can go for more of an aristocrat strategy in mono white, where the sword is just an enabler. Now, being in mono white, the deck would certainly be limited in power level, but it is a new deck concept that didn't really exist until now. But next I want to talk about Alrund, God of the Cosmos. This is a 1-1 that costs 3 blue blue. It gets plus 1 plus 1 for each card in your hand, and each foretold card you own in exile. And at the beginning of your end step, you choose a card type, then reveal the top two cards of your library. You put all cards of the chosen type revealed this way into your hand, and the rest on the bottom of your library in any order. Now, the reverse side of Alrund is Haka, Whispering Raven. This is a 2-3 bird that costs 1 and a blue. It has flying, and whenever Haka, Whispering Raven deals combat damage to a player, you return it to its owner's hand, then scry 2. Now, sadly, Alrund doesn't give us access to any new card types in the command zone, since its reverse side is also a creature. And I don't think Haka is very good in Commander, so we'll be focusing almost exclusively on Alrund. Now, I think Alrund can be pretty decent card draw if you know what type of cards are on top of your deck. Because at best, Alrund will draw you two extra cards each turn, which is, again, very decent. And you could achieve this through top deck manipulation. But I think the most interesting and unique way to enable consistent card draw through Alrund is to play a deck that consists mostly of a single card type. Uh, for example, you could play an artifact deck. Well, if there weren't already much better artifact commanders out there, like Urza, but there's plenty of others as well. Now, I'd like to see a mono blue enchantments deck built around Alrund. If your deck could have, say, 50 enchantments, 35 or so lands, and the rest is support cards, then Alrund's triggered ability would give you a 75% chance to draw at least one card at the end of each turn, and a 25% chance to draw two cards, which is, I think, pretty decent. That said, Alrund is a bit expensive for this effect at 5 mana, and although he can be very big, he has no evasion. Now, Alrund also gets bigger for each Fortel card that you have in exile, but there's only 12 Fortel cards in mono blue, 
And now many of them are playable in Commander, but again, Allrund has no built-in evasion. And so I'm not really sure that going, you know, mono blue Voltron is going to be the most valuable way to play Allrund. I really think that extra card draw is the strongest thing that Allrund has going for him. But let's talk about another mono blue commander in Kosima, God of the Voyage, and the Omen Kill. Kosima is a 2-4 that costs 2 and a blue, and it has, at the beginning of your upkeep, you may exile Kosima. If you do, it gains whenever a land enters the battlefield under your control. If Kosima is exiled, you may put a voyage counter on it. If you don't, return Kosima to the battlefield with X plus 1 plus 1 counters on it, and draw X cards, where X is the number of voyage counters on it. And the Omen Keel is a 3-3 vehicle that costs 1 and a blue. It has crew 1, and whenever a vehicle you control deals combat damage to a player, that player exiles that many cards from the top of their library. You may play land cards from among those cards as long as they remain exiled. Now I can't lie, I'm excited by the prospect of putting a vehicle in the command zone, but Kosama is generally considered to be the much stronger side of this card. The Kosama basically has landfall, giving you a delayed card draw trigger whenever a land enters the battlefield under your control. And notice that Kosama gives you this triggered ability from exile, which is very, very weird. Uh, because Kosama is exiled when these landfall effects happen, there's almost nothing your opponents can do to prevent this from happening, except maybe casting a stifle or something to counter Kosama's triggered ability when she re-enters the battlefield uh, to prevent you from drawing the, all those cards. So Kosama is very resilient and lets you play Mono Blue Landfall, which is also, you know, very novel. But let's talk about the Omen Kill. So the Omen Kill lets you play lands from your opponent's libraries, and it triggers this ability whenever a vehicle you control does combat damage to a player. But it doesn't let you play extra lands each turn, and it only lets you play your opponent's lands, not other cards. So these restrictions make it kind of hard to build around the Omen Kill. Uh, you might try to be really greedy and run a low land count in your own deck and, and then rely on your opponent's lands to make your land drops each turn. This seems awfully risky and it will make you very, very dependent on your commander. Uh, I thought about a strategy using Eldrazi such as Blight Herder to make use of other cards exiled by the Omen Keel. Uh, when you cast Blight Herder, for example, you can put two cards your opponents own from exile into their opponent's graveyards, and if you do, you make three Eldrazi Scion creature tokens. But there's only seven Eldrazi that we can play in Mono Blue that have this ability to pull our opponent's cards out of exile for some benefit, and they're generally not very good. But I'm still excited to have you know, the possibility of a vehicle in the command zone. I just i am not sure how to build around the Omen Keel yet. Definitely let me know in the comments if you have any cool ideas for builds centered around the Omen Keel. But next let's talk about Burgi, God of Storytelling, and Harnfell, Horn of Bounty. Burgi is a 3-3 that costs 2 and red. It has, whenever you cast a spell, add red. Until end of turn, you don't lose this mana as steps and phases end. Seems good. It also has, creatures you control can boast twice during each of your turns rather than once. Seems irrelevant. And Harnfell is an artifact that costs 4 and a red, and it has, discard a card, exile the top two cards of your library. You can play those cards this turn. Now I want to talk about Burgi because of that ability, adding red whenever we cast a spell. I'm pretty sure there's no reasonable way to build around this ability without, you know, inevitably doing some silly, degenerate, stormy things. And that's why I actually want to talk about Harnfell, because I think this side of the card is being unjustifiably ignored. Let's take another look at Harnfell. It says, discard a card, exile the top two cards of your library. You may play those cards this turn. Now notice the absence of a few key things from this ability. First, Harnfell does not tap to do this ability. Second, it does not cost any mana. You can discard a card in your hand for two cards worth of impulsive draw whenever you want and as many times as you have cards in your hand. Now this won't let you dig through your deck indefinitely since you're not actually drawing cards with Harnfell. You're exiling them where you can play them later this turn. Uh, Harnfell is also a little expensive at 5 mana, but beyond those two concerns, this thing is pure value. Harnfell is super reliable, repeatable card draw in the command zone in mono red. Now that's unusual in itself, because usually you need to play some green or blue monstrosity of a deck to get free unlimited card draw just for playing the game. 
And that's what's cool about Harnfell here is that this versatility will support any deck that just wants that extra card draw. And yes, you could also play a Madness deck around it, and that would be pretty cool too. But you could play anything. Mono Red Spellslinger, Mono Red Artifacts, Goblins, Dragons, and never worry about running out of gas. And I think your opponents won't really want to remove Harnfell from the battlefield either. Yes, it does provide you value, but it's not busted. It's not super explosive, and you can just recast it. I mean, unless they're sitting on tons of removal in their hand with nothing to use it on, uh, your Harnfell will probably sit around, you know, undisturbed by anything short of a board wipe, providing you steady and consistent value turn after turn. So I think this is a really cool card and it should be looked at a little bit more. But let's move on. Let's talk about our example from earlier, Essica, God of the Tree. So Essica, God of the Tree, is a 1-4 that costs 1 green green. It has Vigilance, and it can tap for 1 mana of any color. And it also has other legendary creatures you control have Vigilance and tap to add 1 mana of any color. The Prismatic Bridge is an enchantment. It costs Wooburg. It has, at the beginning of your upkeep, you reveal cards from the top of your library until you reveal a creature or Planeswalker card, put that card under the battlefield, and the rest on the bottom of your library in a random order. So if we're playing a non-singleton constructed format, like Modern or Standard, I can include four copies of Essica in my deck. And so I can cast Essica, and I can use her to help generate mana to cast additional copies as the Prismatic Bridge. In Commander, though, we'll only have one copy of Essica. So you have to choose between the God side and the Enchantment side. And unlike so many of the other gods in Kaldheim, I wanted to talk about Essica here because the two sides of this card don't really synergize or to fit into the same deck. Now the Essica side fits most obviously into a Legendary Matters deck, similar to Kethys or Sisse. The Prismatic Bridge, on the other hand, doesn't care about Legendaries at all. The Prismatic Bridge is a really open-ended card that can be used for silly combos, like playing it in a deck that only has one creature or Planeswalker in it, so the Prismatic Bridge always gets that one permanent. Or you can just use it as a general value engine to support any number of different strategies, like Dragons or Eldrazi or Super Friends. So I think when you're building with Essica, it's best to focus almost entirely on one side of the card and you'll generally ignore the other side. Okay, there's plenty of other good gods in Kaldheim, like Valky and a Tybalt that's actually powerful. And as cool as these are, I don't have time to discuss all of them here, and so I focused on the more obscure ones, just because there's already a lot of attention given to some of the more powerful gods. But let's talk about some other interesting legendary creatures in this set that we haven't discussed yet. So for this last segment in our review of Kaldheim, I want to talk about some of the more interesting or obscure non-god legendary creatures that you might consider building around. And first I just want to mention there's a few cool and flavorful creatures here too. I don't have too much to say about these from a gameplay perspective, but from a lore and a flavor perspective, you know, these are pretty cool. We have the return of one of the Praetors in Vorinclex Monstrous Raider, which seems at least slightly less offensive to play against than its earlier incarnation in Vorinclex Voice of Hunger, uh, unless you're playing a deck that cares about counters, in which case the Monstrous Raider probably completely prevents you from playing Magic that game. But you know, that's still less offensive than Vorinclex's Voice of Hunger because that prevented all of your opponents from playing magic. Okay, now that we've gotten that salt out of the way, uh, there's also Tosca Bearer of Secrets, our first legendary squirrel. And that art, it looks more like an alien than a squirrel, but I'm okay with that. No, it doesn't help the squirrel tribe at all if such a tribe exists, but Tosca is still very cool, and I'm sure it'll see play just, to, you know, due to style points alone. But let's move on to some legendaries that have cool gameplay mechanics attached to them. I want to start with Carter, Doom Scourge. Carter is a 4-3 Demon Berserker that costs 2 black red. It has when Carter, Doom Scourge enters the battlefield, until your next turn, creatures your opponents control attack each combat if able, and attack a player other than you if able. Basically this means when it enters the battlefield, you goad each creature your opponents control. Carter also has, when an attacking creature dies, each opponent loses one life and you gain one life. Now goad is a really cool mechanic, and it would be really cool to blink Carter to goad my opponent's creatures repeatedly. Now black and red aren't good colors for blink, but there are a few mediocre options like Conjurer's Closet and Voyager Staff. 
Red also has a few cards that effectively blink Carter by making a token copy of him, like Splinter Twin. Of course, since Carter is legendary, the token copy would die right away, but it would still trigger its Goad Enter the Battlefield ability on its way out. And if we're building around Forced Combat Chaos, there's plenty of other Goad effects in Red, but I'm interested in Carter because it gives us a new color identity for a Goad-based deck, uh, which previously would have been led by the Naya Commander, uh, Marisi, Breaker of the Coil. And don't forget about Carter's second ability. Uh, the abil th that ability to punish opponents whenever any attacking creature dies by draining them for one, whether it's our creature or their creature, it is relevant. And we're going to gain life from this too. So Carter seems really cool. Uh, I don't have much more to say about Carter for now since the card basically tells you how to build around it, but the mechanic is very cool and interesting. But let's mention a more obscure commander in Svela Ice Shaper. This is a 2-4 troll that costs 1 red green. It's also a snow creature, and you can pay 3 and tap it to create a colorless snow artifact token named Icy Manolith that has tap, add 1 mana of any color. So yes, Savella is a gruel commander that makes snow artifact mana rocks. Super weird. You can also pay 6 red green and tap Savella to look at the top 4 cards of your library. You may cast a spell from among them without paying its mana cost. You put the rest on the bottom of your library in a random order. So Svela also has that late game mana sync to help you dig through your deck and cast stuff at instant speed. Now I wanted to mention Svela here just because the things this card does are so unusual for its color combination of red and green, so I think there's a lot, a lot of you know obscure options for building around Svela. But you know what, I already discussed those options in my primer video on Svela, so I'll just link that video here and you can check that video out for more information if you're interested. So let's move on. I want to talk about a couple of clone commanders in Orvar the Allform and Morit of the Frost. Orvar is a 3-3 changeling that costs 3 in the blue. It has whenever you cast an instant or sorcery spell, if it targets one or more other permanents you control, you create a token that's a copy of one of those permanents. It also has when a spell or ability an opponent controls causes you to discard this card, create a token that's a copy of target permanent. But this second ability is completely irrelevant if Orvar is our commander, so we'll ignore it for now. Morit is also a changeling. It is a 0-0 that costs 2 green, blue, blue. It has you may have Morit of the Frost enter the battlefield as a copy of a permanent you control, except it's legendary and snow in addition to its other types. And if it's a creature, it enters with two additional plus one plus one counters on it and has changeling. So first, both of these commanders are changelings. That means they have all creature types. So if you were playing a tribal tribal deck with you know, Mistform Ultimus as your commander, then Orvar or Marit are pretty much a complete upgrade. You can play any of your lords or other tribal synergies for any single tribe and they'll benefit Orvar and Marit. Which is very cool, but that's not even what I want to talk about today. I want to talk about these commanders because they give you a clone effect in your command zone. Now there's plenty of other commanders that can copy or create copies of other things, even in the command zone. But most of these copy creatures. Orvar and Marit are unique in that they can copy any permanent you control. There are other cards that can do this, but again, not in your command zone. Now let's discuss Marit first, since this is probably the simpler of the two commanders. Uh, relatively simpler anyways, there's still a lot of silly things that you can do with Marit. So Marit enters the battlefield as a copy of any permanent you control, except it's legendary in snow, and if it's a creature, it's still a changeling, and it enters with those two plus one plus one counters. Now there are cool things you can do, like copying a Glen Alenda Archmage, because you know, since Marie enters the battlefield with those two plus one plus one counters, you'll get you know infinitely recurrable counter spells. But there's plenty of good non-creature permanents to copy too. Do you want two Isochron Scepters? Go for it. Orvar is a bit trickier to get started, and it's mono blue instead of Simic like Morit. But in return, the ceiling on Orvar is probably a lot higher. Imagine casting a cheap cantrip like Leap on a Torrential Gearhulk while you've got Orvar on the battlefield. Orvar makes a token copy of the Gearhulk, which recurs an instant from your graveyard. If that instant can target Torrential Gearhulk, you'll make another copy of it, and so on. And if those instants were cantrips, you'll end up making several copies of the Gearhulk and drawing several cards, but depending on how many instants you had in your graveyard that could target your you know, Torrential Gearhulk. And that's just one silly combo. 
There's plenty of other things and much more powerful things you can do with Orvar that will generate value much more explosively than Marit will for the most part. But with Orvar, you will need to find a delicate balance of permanents that you want to copy and spells that you can target those permanents with to make copies of them. And it's probably not going to be super simple to get that balance just right. So that is call time. There's a lot of cool stuff here for you know, Commander in this format. The return of snow permanence, some really cool MDFC commanders, and a bit of support for plenty of different tribes like giants, angels, and elves. But that is all I have for today. Please like this video or subscribe if you found any of this useful. I make commander-focused content showing you all sorts of unconventional ways that you can build your commander decks, from budget alternatives to deck techs to top 10 lists. And thank you for watching.